Eve Ensler is an artist. So this celebration of Atlanta's artists is an appropriate way to welcome Eve to our great city. She wrote and performed to great acclaim the Vagina Monologues, you all know that, and won an Obie Award in 1997 for Best New Play. The play has now been performed around the world, and right, I mean, how many people did she inspire with that play? We heard one of them tonight. And the possibilities for inspiring others is endless, especially when your play has been translated into more than 45 languages. It's amazing. And she interviewed more than 200 women for the play. Through the play and the notoriety it has brought her, Eve speaks both for herself but also as a victim of family violence, but she has also given voice to the experiences of so many women who might not have been able to find the words or the courage to stand before another human being, let alone the world, and say that she was wronged. The play's success inspired Eve to create the day a global movement to stop violence against women and girls, which has educated millions about violence against women and raised more than $70 million for anti-violence organizations around the world through local benefit performances of the Vagina Monologues and other events. This has helped support more than 11,000 anti-violence programs in local communities and safe houses, from the DRC Congo to Haiti, Kenya, South Dakota, Egypt, and Iraq, and I'm sure many others. Through her work with B-Day, Eve has visited more than 40 countries, including Afghanistan, the former Yugoslavia, and Kenya, and interviewed women in devastated communities who have been raped, who have been tortured, who have lost their families to war and suffered other forms of violence. Their stories, as well as her own, inform Ensler's first book, insecure at last, losing it in a security-obsessed world, in which she examines how the current obsession with security undermines our humanity, and she has also testified before Congress on this topic. I think we are so honored here in Atlanta to have you, Eve. Thank you to One Billion Rising Atlanta for bringing Eve to us.
I feel like I'm, I, I'm going to be like in Bangladesh in a day, you know, I'm going to go from here to Bangladesh and I'm going to bring Atlanta to Bangladesh and then I'm going to bring Bangladesh to the Philippines. I love, I, I love this idea that I just kind of carry everybody with me to the next place, you know. <laughs> but um, I really want to um, just talk a little bit about OBR because I have the benefit of knowing a lot about it. And, and sometimes um, people don't know what I know. So I feel like I need to share it because it's pretty incredible. Um, I um, also want to say that um, I think about violence against women right now a lot. Um, I think we're living in one of the most violent times I've ever seen in this country, in every respect. From a presidential race that feels like um, the beginning of the, the, the end of the world, to be honest. And um, I feel now more than ever what we know in our bodies, what women know in our souls, what we know in our spirits, we have to be brave, folks. We have to yes. speak out. Yes. We have to say, we have to call what's being done in our midst what it is. Yes. When it's racism, we have to say it's racism. When it's sexism and misogyny, we have to say that. Yes. When it's being mean to disabled people, we have to say that. Mm. When we see presidential candidates mm. oh. who speak hate and incite hate and birth hate, we have to call that out. Yeah. And, I, and I start this evening with that because it's really critical. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, all around the world right now, the birth of this right-wing, very um, fascist, very race-hating, very woman-hating movement is happening everywhere. It's happening across Europe. It's happening in India. It's happening in Turkey. At, at the same time as this incredible desire and movement towards emancipation, liberation, equality, and love. And I think they're just like rising like this, you know? And we have to be stronger, we have to be better, we have to be more loving, we have to be more profound, we have to be more everything so we get there. Yes. Um, yes. We have amazing coordinators in this movement. Women and a couple of men who have been really staggering activists in their own countries for years and years, who really kind of joined together three years ago to be the kind of, um, I, I would say, core body of this movement, who come together once a year, who look at issues, who make decisions, who call out the themes, and they represent, there are 30 coordinators, some of them represent regions, some of them represent countries. Um, but I want to say that they're, if you go on the website and look at their pictures, they're amazing human beings. And when we met last year in New York, we come together for three or four days, and everybody shares what's going on in their regions, and we talk about the issues, we talk about what's coming up, we talk about what needs to be addressed. And last year, it was very clear that every place on the planet was looking at the issues of marginalized people. People who don't get seen, people who don't get heard, people who are disappeared, people whose lives don't matter, right? And the call this year was really um, to rise for and with the marginalized and to make sure they had the platform and make sure they had the voice and make sure they were in the lead. And it's incredible to see um, what's happened as a result of that call. Um, and I just want to give you a taste because uh, all these risings are about to happen in the next, some of them have already started. This morning I got an email at the start of the day from Macho, way up in India, where the Tibetans were rising with the Indians, and they were showing me fields of people dancing, and where girls' schools, 3,000 school girls in each school were dancing in fields, I and mean, it was so beautiful, that's how the day began. Um, so we are rising with Say Her Name, and for those of you who don't know Say Her Name, Say Her Name is an amazing movement founded by the African American Policy Forum and Kimberly Crenshaw. We have in deep solidarity with them to say her name, to say the name of the women, black women in this country who have been killed by the police, and to say her name and remember her name until these awful killings stop. We are rising with the women and black women in Oklahoma City who were raped by the policemen who have finally received some justice, but we have to keep on it to make sure that justice is delivered. Yes. We are rising for garment workers in Bangladesh 
where I'm headed, and I know most of you remember the Rana Plaza disaster, which was a building in, yes. in, in Dhaka, a building that everybody knew was a bad building, was not a solid building, so much so that all the rich people moved out their stuff the day before. And the day when the workers arrived, who were mainly women, so poor, most of them were making maybe a dollar a day at best. They were, knew the building was going to collapse. And the factory owners and the managers told them if they didn't go in, they would be docked a month's salary. A month's salary is like the end of a person's life there. They went in and literally half an hour, the buildings collapsed. 1,200 people died. Now I want to tell you, most of those women are making clothes for us. Most of those women are making clothes that are cheap clothes for us, right? We all have to be really conscious that when we rise in Bangladesh, we have to rise here for our sisters in Bangladesh who make those clothes. And there's a report that just came out by my sisters um, which basically says in the years since Rana Plaza, not one thing has changed. Okay, the safety conditions are just as bad. It's basically slave labor. I feel like what's happening now in this movement is there is such an attempt to break through these walls that keep us ignorant, that keep us divided, that keep us separate, so that we know every time we buy a shirt, we either wear a woman's pain or we free a woman's pain. Yes. And it's up to us to do that. Yes. Um, we are rising with restaurant workers uh, um, in this country who are demanding a fair wage and not being Woo! dependent on tipping. And um, I, I was just with um, Saru Jaramala, who's the head of the Restaurant Association, and she's an unbelievable activist. And they have managed now to really work and and connect with restaurant owners and employers who are beginning to understand that the health of our restaurants is connected to the health of the people working in our restaurants. Yes. And that's not separate. And that where women are forced to work for tips, sexual harassment is the highest in the restaurant industry than any industry at all. Yeah. And that if we actually had fair wage for workers, which are mainly women, they wouldn't have to be objectified, they wouldn't have to use their bodies, they wouldn't have to tolerate aggressive, horrible behavior. So we are rising with the restaurant workers. In Europe, all over Europe, it's amazing to see what's happening, that women are rising with refugees. And um, as we know, this has been a year where we have seen um, so many people in Syria, in Iraq, in Sudan, in, in other countries, fleeing the worst atrocities on the planet, which by the way, this country has been very responsible for creating, okay? Meanwhile, and as has Europe, meanwhile when they appear on our doorstep for help, we turn them into criminals and enemies and terrorists and people we don't love, in spite of the fact that they have nothing. And I'm really moved to see that in Germany, in Italy, in Croatia, all throughout London, people are rising this year with refugees. So much so that in Germany, they're doing workshops to teach refugees the dance so they can dance with them. And if you go online, there's a beautiful song. It just makes me cry every time I see it. By a beautiful German activist. It's called Station of Welcome. And she made this song for greeting refugees and migrant workers and anyone coming over. And she filmed it on the tracks, the, the train tracks of Germany, which references, obviously, World War II and what happened with the Jews and, and the gays and the gypsies who were taken. And there she is dancing on the tracks with all these OBR women greeting the refugees who were coming over the border. It's a beautiful song, and definitely go look at it. So we're rising for the refugees. Um, we're rising with the indigenous women. And this is happening all over the world. In the, in the Philippines, for example, where the mining companies have come way up in the mountains, 
um, with the Lumads, who are just beautiful indigenous women and people who've been there forever. The mining companies are extracting their oil land and extracting the mines and throwing the Lumads who have been there forever out and raping their daughters, so much so that they have fled into the cities where they don't even know how to function. And there are massive riot, risings happening right now for the Lumads, and I'm going to get to go and be with them in the Philippines. But we're also rising with the women at Idle No More in Canada, who are also facing the same issues. We're rising with Winona Leduc and um, Honor the Earth, because in the back in oil fields, um, where there's insane fracking going on, they have created man camps. Um, I don't know if you all know about the man camps in back in oil fields, but the man camps are where lots of men come in to do the fracking and do the work, and as a result, um, there's been massive sexual abuse of Native women in back in oil fields. So we are rising with honor the earth and the women of the back in oil fields. We are rising to stop the sex trafficking in Mexico, Miami, Atlanta, and Santa Fe. And um, I'm really proud to see how strong these movements have gotten, particularly in the places I just mentioned, in Miami and in Mexico, there are massive risings in Mexico. I think, I, I just heard that all 22 states will be rising, and I'm talking about thousands of people, and all rising to stop the trafficking of girls. Um, college campuses are rising to end sexual harassment. And we know that the statistics are insane, one out of five, um, girls will be harassed, sexually harassed on college campuses. But you know, today and, and yesterday, I was listening to stories of high school girls and middle school girls, and how many girls now are killing themselves in middle schools and high schools because their rapes are being put online. And they're being shown all over the school so that even when the girl tries to come forward, she is so deeply humiliated and deeply blamed for what's going on that she takes her own life. So we, we must rise for our girls to insist that we have sexual education, that we start teaching boys what consent means, that we teach people what sex is and what healthy sex is so that they stop abusing girls. We are rising in Kabul, in Congo, and Iraq to end the rape and killings that are a result of the aftermath of the empiric, colonialist, aggressive wars basically led by the United States. Um, certainly in Iraq, um, and certainly in Afghanistan. And I was just with my sisters from Afghanistan and um, Iraq a few weeks ago. We did a big event in New York where we all came together to talk about the intersections of what's going on with Women, for example, who are, are, are black women in this country who are fighting military and state police violence and the connection to women who are fighting um, rape in Afghanistan after our military has been there. And there are deep connections. But one of the things I think is very powerful is to see how women in Iraq are rising up to help their sisters who are being caught by ISIS who are being enslaved by ISIS, how they're freeing them, how they're building safe houses for them, how they're reaching out and, and working with them to transform their consciousness in spite of the risks they have to take. And that's absolutely true in Kabul as well. We're rising in India, in the Philippines, for climate justice. And I, I think um, it's so clear now. I mean, if, if OBR has taught us all everything, anything, it's that we can't operate in silos anymore. We can't think about violence against women and girls unless we think about what we're doing to the earth. Because you look at it, for example, at man-made disasters, okay? Look at Katrina, look at Takaban, look at all the uh, global south where so much of, of the storms that are happening are destroying lands and lives. Who suffers? Who's on the front lines? Women. Who gets raped in the night when electricity goes? When the, when the climate disasters come? Women. So I'm really happy to say that there are massive movements and, and risings happening for the earth all over the planet, and that movements are coming together where people who are fighting for an end to climate, for climate justice and an end to the destruction of the earth are understanding the connections to destroying women's bodies. 
I think the more we build our connections and weave our connections, the more powerful we become. I think what the powers that be understand is if they separate us, and they say, you deal with race over there, and you deal with women over there, and you deal with economics over there, and you, guess what? We're not strong at all. Because we fight for the same resources, and we fight for the same media, and we fight for the same attention. But when we understand this is one story, this is one story, and we're all fighting each other's struggles, I may have my particular struggle that's particular to my history, but that doesn't mean my struggle's more important. It doesn't mean my pain is more pain. It just means I'm more familiar with that story. And what it means is I have to familiarize myself with all the other stories so that I can struggle with and in service to those stories and, 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 and let the people who are taking the lead there take the lead and I follow, and I'll take the lead where my story is my story. But we all have to learn to lead and follow. It's really important. Yeah. Um, we're rising to end female genital mutilation in Kenya, in the Gambia, and all over Western Africa. And I'm going to share a wonderful story. There's an amazing organizer named Isetu Toure, who's one of my heroes. And I met Isetu many years ago. She um, has been in the forefront. She's a doctor on the forefront in Gambia in stopping female gender mutilation. And for three years, OVR has been very, very strong in the Gambia. They have been outrageous. They have been outrageous in every respect. They have defied the government. They have danced like you can't believe. They have won. A month ago, President of Gambia decreed FGM illegal. <laughs> And that's now going to have, it's going to have a rollover impact in all of Western Africa. So they can honestly attribute the dancing, the coming together of all these groups who were never working together before, coming together to fight has been a huge part of that victory. So I, I just want to say I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, um, we're rising to honor our sisters in Palestine and in Palestine, uh, women in the marginalized areas in the Jordan Valley, a place that women face domestic violence and daily harassment, surmounting atrocities from the Israeli occupation and illegal Israeli settlers who are building their settlements on the land of the Palestinians and increasing their suffering from lack of water, health, education. So we are rising with the women of Palestine. Um, about men because there's so many men who are part of One Million Rising now. And if you go look at the videos, you can see how many men are dancing and how many men are part of this movement. Um, we're rising with chiefs in Zimbabwe, who I got to meet um, last year. The traditional chiefs, the, the women are so clever. They went to the traditional chiefs who normally wouldn't get involved in ending the oppressive um, situations of women. Uh, that of violence, that of lack of equality, and they danced. They danced with them. And the chiefs loved the dancing. So they opened up a dialogue. And when I was there, I literally saw the chiefs of the tribes standing there like this. Right? Um, it has opened huge inroads, and women are really beginning to see a major adjustment, a major reclamation of their basic rights. Um, I can say that in Pakistan, men are rising, in the Philippines, men are rising, all over this country, men are rising, in Canada. I mean, it's really beginning to happen that men are owning this movement and taking this movement and finding their way into this movement with their bodies and their beings and their hearts. And as a man said earlier tonight, until men make any violence against women their central issue, the way they make football their central issue, nothing's going to change. It is not our issue. We've, we've taken this on out of the generosity of our hearts, but it turns out we don't rape ourselves. This is not our issue. This is a men's issue. It's a human issue, but really it's a men's issue because if they would stop it, it would end. Do you know? So really, it is about the level of commitment men are willing to make to this issue and to their brothers around them, who they hear degrading women, putting women down, saying things about women, calling them out, standing up and being brave. 
We're rising with trans women all around the world to end the horrible murders of trans women and the incredible violence for them. In Hong Kong and in Italy, we're rising with um, domestic workers, and I'm very proud to say that I'll be in Hong Kong over this tour, and there's going to be a rising of 10,000 domestic workers in Hong Kong because Sunday is their day off, and it will be massive. Um, the treatment of domestic workers throughout the world, as we know, is, is really quite horrible, but particularly abroad, where women have very little protections. So then, for example, in London, um, uh, rich Saudis can bring over their own private Filipino domestic workers in their house where they have no eyes on them or no transparency and they can do whatever they want inside their house to their workers. They can beat them, they can rape them, they can hold them in prisons. And part of what the, what the domestic workers are saying is that we are not slaves. We are not slaves. We are workers who need rights, who need to be respected, who need transparency, and who need love. And so we will be rising with them. Um, I can keep going on, but I want to um, just say one of the things that I think is beginning to happen is we're beginning to rise for better governance and better leaders. And I just, I just want to say um, a few words um, about that. I, I, I don't know about all of you, but watching this election, particularly Donald Trump, has been for me um, one of the more, um, I think one of the lowest moments of our country's history. I really do. And I want to say this to everybody, it's not a joke. Um, I think we all wanted to believe it was a joke and it would go away. But I think this is how fascism begins. I think this is how the creeping, racist, misogynist haters begin. We all think it's a joke. We can't believe it. We, they don't mean it. They couldn't be doing this. We say this to ourselves because we don't want to believe people are really like that. You know? And it's real. It's real. And we have to treat it like it's real. And I'm saying this because I think, in some ways, I've never felt more afraid as I feel right now. I really feel afraid for this country. I feel afraid. And I think all of us have to speak out. Um, and we started something called Stop Hate, Dumb Trump, and you can go to it and sign up. But what I want to say to everybody here is speak out. Yes. Say what you're feeling. Name it. It's yes. not funny. It's not funny that Donald Trump says, my followers will follow me even if I shoot people on Fifth Avenue. That's not funny. That's serious. That's serious. First of all, what kind of followers would follow you if you murdered people? And yes. second of all, why are you making jokes about gun when we have seen more gun murders in this country this yes. year than we've ever seen in this country? Yes. It's not funny that Donald Trump says we can ban Muslims from coming into our country. That's against the Constitution. Yes. What Constitution will he be following? Yes. It's not, it's not funny when he makes fun of people in turbans or disabled people or he talks about Black Lives Matter activists that they should be kicked and, and, and beaten at his rallies for protesting him. This is not funny. Yes. And all of us need to take this very seriously yes. and respond to it. Because if we join together in rising up this hate, we will find the love we need right now to take us where we need to go. Yes. So, I just want to say a couple of things about dancing. Um, one of the biggest questions in our first year, I would go on all these very, um, um, really, really sophisticated British you know, journalist shows, and they would say, but tell me, tell me, what does dancing do, right? It, it, it was like, I, I, I just couldn't believe that anyone was asking that question. It's like, what does breathing do? Um, well, yes. it's not alive. Um, but, um, and it really began to be like that question, like that meme. It's kind of like the, the question, like, how can I describe it? It's like, how do we explain the difference between a man and a woman? Would a woman ask another woman, what does dancing do? No. You would not ask that because your body is so critically connected to everything in your life, right? And I feel like what I've seen over the last three years, my answer to that question is dancing does everything. Yes! It does everything. And, and I want to say why. I want to say why. For most of us, at least the women, and I think we're going to discover over time how many men have been abused, 
how many men have been raped as children, how many men have been battered, and we know that, that patriarchy is the greatest tyranny in the world and is the greatest perpetuator of violence on boys by killing their hearts and shutting down their bodies and killing off their feelings and vulnerability. But in terms of women, we know at least that one out of three women on this planet has suffered major violence, which means you witness someone if you haven't, which has changed you because you know it can happen to you, so you're always acting as if it might happen someday. Because of that, what's happened at a very young age for many of us is we leave our bodies. I would venture to say there are one billion women refugees from their bodies on this planet. One billion women wandering the planet looking for their homes called their bodies. And I think about this all the time. What would happen if we all came back into our bodies? What would happen if women just slid back into our bodies, into our stomachs and breasts and legs and vaginas and we inhabited ourselves? The whole world would change overnight. It would change overnight because we'd be in our love, we'd be in our creativity, we'd be in our imagination, we'd be in our power, we'd be in our connection, we'd be in our mystical, divine madness, right? What does dancing do? It brings you into your body. Yes! It brings you into your body. And I think what dancing does, what we do with other people, it brings us into their bodies. Yes. And it brings us into other bodies. And all these walls that we create, and all these stories we create that keep us separated from us when we're dancing, yeah. you're just moving. Yeah. That is, all that stuff just goes away. Yes. And that's the work we have to be doing right now, is melting the walls of our separateness. Dissolving the ways we don't feel each other, and feel for each other, and feel with each other, and of each other, because that is the way of hatred. And that is the way of discompassion and disembodiment, so that we can hurt each other and not feel when we're hurting each other. You know, you couldn't hurt somebody if you were inside their body, because you would know what their body was feeling, you know? And you couldn't hurt someone if you were in your own body, because your own body would know what they were feeling. So part of it is like, how do we come back into these bodies? And dancing is the secret. Dancing is the key, not to mention sex, but that's another story. <laughs> um, I want to um, just say that I think um, dancing is fluid, it's invitational, it's not hierarchical, it's contagious, it's a catalyst, an energy, it's an act of faith and trust, a belief that we are in this together. I spent most of my life trying to come back into this body. <laughs> I, got, I got exiled at a very young age, I was raped by my father, I was beaten by my father, and this, I'm not saying this for pity because I don't feel sorry for myself anymore. It took me a long time not to. But I know that the journey back into to my body took a lot. It took a lot of friends, it took a lot of therapy, it took a lot of dancing, it took community, it took community, it took community. We cannot come back into our bodies alone. We got left out of our bodies alone. Usually somebody rapes us in the dark, or comes in in the middle of the night, or does it in an alleyway. We left alone. We left here alone, so we got to come back here together. And I think one of the beautiful things about this night is seeing all these beautiful people up on the stage, weaving their stories, weaving their magic, weaving their vision, weaving their poetry in and out of each other. And it means we're here together weaving this new story. Um, I'm going to close. Um, with a, a piece that I wrote last year, but I really feel like I want to do it for Atlanta tonight. I just want to say how much I love Atlanta. Uh, I, I really love this guy. I think, I think in some ways, in America, it's the, one of the only cities I've ever felt where black and white people are together. Um, where there's, there's like, it's not tokenism, where there's real um, coming together, and, and because of that, the energy here is so beautiful. And um, I, every time I come here, I feel like, wow, there's a city in America that actually works, you know? Um, um, and I, I just want to say to all the people here in Atlanta who have been working on this movement for so many years, who did V-Days, who did OBRs, who did, um, thank you. Thank you for carrying this energy here and for making this such a beautiful place and, and, and such a place. All the women who talked tonight, all the years they've given to ending violence against women, all the organizations people have created, all the love people, that is why we're still here. 
That is why we're still here. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. My revolution begins in the body. It isn't waiting anymore. My revolution does not need approval or permission. It happens because it has to happen in each neighborhood, village, city, or town. A gathering of tribes, fellow students, women at the market, on the bus. It may be gradual and soft. It may be spontaneous and loud. It may be happening already. It may be found in your closet, your drawers, your guts, your legs, your multiplying cells, in the naked mouth of taut nipples and overflowing breasts. My revolution is swelling from the insatiable drumming between my legs. My revolution is willing to die for this. My revolution is ready to live big. My revolution is overthrowing the state of mind called patriarchy. My revolution will not be choreographed, although it begins with a few familiar steps. My revolution is not violent, but does not shy away from the dangerous edges where fierce displays of resistance tumble into something new. My revolution is in this body, in these hips atrophied by misogyny, in this jaw wired mute by hunger and atrocity. My revolution is connection, not consumption, passion, not profit, orgasm, not ownership. My revolution is of the earth and will come from her, for her, because of her. It understands that every time we frack or drill or burn or violate the layers of her sacredness, we violate the soul of our future. My revolution is not ashamed to press my body down on her mud floor in front of bayan, cypress, pine, collion, oak, chestnut, mulberry, redwood, sycamore trees. To bow shamelessly to shocking yellow birds and rose blue setting skies and heart exploding purple bougainvillea and aqua sea. My revolution gladly kisses the feet of mothers and nurses and servers and cleaners and nannies and healers and all those who are life and give life. My revolution is on its knees, on my knees to every holy thing, and to those who carry empire-made burdens in and on their heads and backs and hearts. My revolution demands abandon, expects the original, relies on troublemakers, anarchists, poets, shamans, seers, sexual explorers, tricksters, mystic travelers, tightrope walkers, and those who go too far and feel too much. My revolution shows up unexpectedly. It's not naive, but believes in miracles. Cannot be categorized, targeted, branded, or even located. Offers prophecy, not prescription. Is determined by mystery and ecstatic joy. Requires listening. It's not centralized, though we all know where we're going. It happens in stages and all at once. It happens where you live and everywhere. It understands that divisions are diversions. It requires sitting still and staring deep into my eyes. Go ahead, love. Bless you all. For all the replay viewers, please heart it up and share. Thanks so much. Listen, can we just sing one more song together before we get out of here? Can we sing one more?